Our next speaker is Rabbi Joshua Collett from West End Synagogue. Welcome, Rabbi. Thank you so much. I want to begin by thanking all of those who join us today to speak up against anti-Semitism. Today, as we mark a new anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz, we come together as we try to bring some light into the world. We are here because we are worried about the ongoing spread of the most pervasive and corrosive conspiracy theory of all times. We are here because even if we don't say it often enough, even if we would like things to be different, the truth is that we are afraid. We are afraid because even if Jews make for only 2% of the US population, we continue to be the number one target of anti-religious hate crimes here in America. We are afraid because we have witnessed how some members of Congress have justified white nationalists while others continue to demonize the state of Israel. We are afraid because we just learned about a school here in Tennessee who is banning books like this one because they seem to be more concerned about rough language than about teaching about the Holocaust. We are afraid because one in three Jewish students have experienced anti-Semitism on college campuses here in the US during the last school year. We are afraid because we have heard the anti-Semitic chants of those who marched in Charlottesville in 2017. We have seen pictures with the anti-Semitic gear that was used by some of those who stormed the US Capitol a year ago. And we have read a variety of anti-Semitic remarks coming from a number of religious leaders belonging to all kinds of different religious denominations. Now we know that all these hateful manifestations do not represent our nation. We know that we have a lot of allies and friends and we are truly grateful for them. We are grateful for you for joining us today. But you know what? Even if we can count on our allies and friends, and that is something that certainly warms our hearts and our souls, that doesn't take away from the fact that today we are experiencing not only a spike in anti-Semitic events all around us, but also a normalization of some of that gruesome rhetoric that creates the conditions for anti-Semitism to thrive and to endure. We are so afraid, just for you to have an idea, that when we come to our synagogues, we are always trying to identify the closest exit door in case of an emergency. We are so afraid that we have to attend active shooter trainings and plan safety drills on a regular basis. We are so afraid that we have to continually look for extra funds to upgrade our unsecure, our own buildings. And you know what? All of that takes a toll, a physical toll, a mental toll, and a spiritual toll as well. Synagogues and other Jewish institutions are called to be welcoming and warm places where people of all ages can pray, study, socialize, and embrace those who are suffering the most. Synagogues are meant to be open places to shelter the needy and to heal the wounded without having to risk being taken hostage by deranged terrorists with distorted views of who is running the world. So yes, we are afraid, but you know what? We won't let that fear 
to dictate the conditions of what we are all about. Today, we clearly state that we won't let fear paralyze us and we won't let the anti-Semites win. Today, we are here to clearly state that we believe in hope, that we are stronger than those who want to destroy us, and that together we can create a reality in which there won't be any room for anti-Semitism nor for other forms of bigotry, xenophobia, or hatred. Today, we are called to strengthen our resolve as we continue to shape a society that is proud of embracing people of different backgrounds, races, sexual orientations, and religions. Today, we remember that as Auschwitz survivor Primo Levi once wrote, Every time that a nation finds itself holding that every stranger is an enemy, we need to know that at the end of that chain, we will find a concentration camp. In other words, every time that we as a society play a scavenger hand signaling outcasts, we risk losing our essence as human beings. Every time we push for the type of uniformity that denies any chance for dissent, we all lose. When everything is painted in only one color, we endanger the spiritual state of our communal soul as we erase the precious diversity that makes for who we truly are. So despite the urge to point fingers at those who look like strangers to us, despite the lure of suppressing those with a different political view than our own, we should work to create a pluralistic and inclusive society, open to everyone that brings a generous heart to the mix, a society that is a welcoming to all those who are invested in developing a diverse and multicultural space in our midst. The only way to defeat anti-Semitism is by investing in this kind of multicolored society. And that is why we as Jews, that is why we need to respond to anti-Semitism not by hiding who we are, but by proudly embracing our own Jewish identity. We need to respond to those who wish our demise by lighting Shabbat candles every week and by doing more tzedakah. We should do it by attending and supporting our synagogues and institutions and by engaging in projects of tikkun olam as we continue with the holy work of amending this broken world. And while we do all of that and so much more, we need to continue building bridges, fostering new relationships and expanding our circle of friends. We are all in this together and together we shall overcome. So finally, on a new anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz, I want to end by quoting words from Eli Wiesel, another Auschwitz survivor and a Nobel Prize winner, who in 1992 wrote the following lines to a group of college students. And now I am quoting from him. He said, all collective judgments are wrong. Only racists make them. And racism is stupid just as it is ugly. Its aim is to destroy to pervert, to distort innocence in human beings and their quest for human equality. Racism is misleading. There are good people and bad people in every community. No human race is superior. No religious faith is inferior. We all come from somewhere and we all wonder where we are going. I know you have been tested during your years in school more than once, but the real tests are still ahead of you. 
How will you deal with your own or other people's hunger, homelessness, sexual or gender discrimination, and community antagonisms? The world outside is not waiting to welcome you with open arms. The economic climate is bad. The psychological one is worse. You wonder, will you find jobs, allies, friends? I pray to our Father in heaven to answer yes to all these questions. But should you encounter a temporary disappointment, I also pray, do not make someone else pay the price for your pain. Do not see in someone else a scapegoat for your difficulties. Only a fanatic does that, not you. For you have learned to reject fanaticism. You know that fanaticism leads to hatred and hatred is both destructive and self-destructive. I speak to you as a teacher and as a student. One is both always. I also speak as a witness. I speak to you for I do not want my past to become your future. And that's the end of the quote. So today, I also speak to you as Elie Wiesel, because I don't want that tragic and painful past to become our own present or our future. That is my prayer, and that is also my hope. Thank you very much.